All righty, thank you for coming. Um, welcome to Becoming Pro Artists. Today we are here with landscape artist Jane Ann Woodhead. My name is Emma Jean Wilkins. I'm the product manager here at Sentient, and I run the behind the scenes of the website and our social media. We are joined by Savannah and Julie, also part of the Sentient team, so they may pop in occasionally. Um, this interview is going to be an opportunity for us to get to know up and coming artists, to hear their insights and their story. Just a reminder that if you go to sentientacademy.com, then to courses and search for becoming a pro artist. This streaming session will be placed there as well as other past and upcoming events. You can always watch through YouTube, but if you'd like to participate, please switch over to the Sentient website. If you guys have any questions, feel free to pop them down in the chat below and we'll spend some time at the end reviewing them. All right, let's start. Um, Jane Ann, what has been your journey like to become a professional artist? Um, well, thanks, first of all, for having me uh, today. I think I'm excited to share my story. Um, I, I think my journey has been a little different than maybe most because I have started later in life. So I've kind of taken a, a roundabout way to get here. Um, so I thought I might just, I don't know, just share um, how I got here, kind of share my story to start with. Is that that? that would that be good? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, and why it took me so long to get here, <laughs> but I, I grew up with, with parents who are really artistic and they, um, my dad was a landscape architect and he was also a, a hobbyist artist and he his style was kind of a very contemporary mid-century so we grew up with his paintings on our walls and my mom was also very creative and she provided for us lots of opportunities to be creative and supplies at home to be creative and she also later in life started taking some art classes and so I kind of I was surrounded by artistic people and artistic things from my early childhood. Um, and I remember uh, my dad was the first one who taught me how to draw in perspective. Like, and I, those straight lines of going towards the vanishing point was like, it was magic to me. I loved it. I loved, and I, I loved horses and I loved drawing. So I kind of felt like I had a little bit of some talent, but I, I didn't think I was really good enough to do anything with it. And it just kind of feels at, I don't know, it feels silly to think about it now, but I just, I thought you either had it or you didn't. And I, I thought I had a little bit, but not enough to do anything really with it. So by the time I got to college, I had not really had any art classes um, in high school or anything. Um, I did have an art class, uh, an art class in high school, but it was more crafty. It was, it was just doing crafty things. And so I decided to go into design because I felt like that was, that filled that need for me a little bit, but it wasn't, it wasn't the fine art because I didn't think I could do that, but I thought I could do design. So I loved it. And I loved, you know, the, the classes that I had, there, there were drafting and and we rendered interiors and we used lots of mediums and all of this was obviously before a computer. So I loved doing it with my hands too. But I remember when I was, I had one class back then, the design students were in a different building than the fine art students. And I, and I had, so I had one class in the fine art building, which was an art history class. And I remember walking through the halls and seeing the students work up on the halls and thinking, Oh, they're so good. I wish I could do that. That is, <laughs> uh, you know, I just, I wish I was good enough to do that. And, and still then I didn't realize what it took. I didn't understand what it took to learn a skill. And so over the years, so I graduated with my degree in design. I, started a family and through all of that life, I was trying to do something creative. I would, I sewed, I quilted, I taught myself how to knit. I did some things with um, 
paper art. I did watercolors off and on through all this process. But as my children started, I like it felt like I needed to do something, but I would always get tired of it. Like if I had after a couple of years, I felt like, OK, I want to do something else. I, this is I, I've done what I want to do with this. And so by the time my children started to get older, I, I started to have this feeling inside of me like, I want to do fine art. I want to do it. Maybe I could do it. I don't know. Maybe I could. Maybe I couldn't. And over the course of, I would say it took probably 10 years, that feeling started to really build up inside of me strong enough that I couldn't ignore it any longer. And it's hard to explain, but it's like almost, it was almost physiological. Like I felt it inside of me waiting to come out. Just, you can do this, just do it. And, and it pushed me, that feeling pushed me to move past the fear of deciding whether I could do it. I knew I could do it. Um, so I signed up for my first art class at 51. And, um, and that's a whole nother long story, which I probably don't have time to get into, <laughs> but I, because of that first art class, I started going to art shows and art events. And I, um, went to one art show about nine months after I started this other art class. It was just a once a week class, just very very casual. I only painted once a week during class. I didn't think to even paint at all during the week. So, but I started going to these events and I went to one show that was kind of a booth show. And I watched by this artist who was a young mom and I looked at her at work and I thought, Oh, that's really nice. I like that. I think I could probably do that. Um, and she could tell I was interested and she struck up a conversation with me. And that conversation changed the whole trajectory of my thinking and of where I was going. And her name is Carrie Hammond. Some of you may know her. Um, as it turns out, we moved a few years ago and we moved unknowingly about 30 seconds away from her. So we still have a, a great friendship and we still paint together, but she became my first mentor. She asked me questions about what art I wanted to do and what I'm doing. And I told her at that time, I was thinking about maybe going back to school and getting a master's degree. And when she found out what kind of art I wanted to do, she said, don't do that. Just don't go back to school. This is what you need to do. Get these are the books you need to read. These are the workshops you need to go to study and read and paint and study and read and paint. And that completely changed everything. And um, that was about eight years, nine years ago. So from then on, I, um, I just was kind of all in. Like when I found, when I found out about planner painting that I could paint outside, that um, I, it was kind of my conversion. Like I, I loved it. So um, from then on, I just started doing what she told me to do. And I started taking classes and I started getting out of my comfort zone and doing things that I never thought I would do. And, and it provided me a lot of, um, I, I don't know, it gave me, it, it just, it was, it was, I think, little by little over the years, it, um, I began to see and that I could do this professionally and that I wanted to, and this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I, and then since then just have been working hard ever since. That's amazing. So, yeah. Um, would you be interested in showing your work right now? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Let me share screen real quick. All right, here we go. Go to this next page. Would you like to discuss any of these pieces that you've shared with us? Um, sure. 
let's see. Well, this one that you have up right here is probably, um, I think it's the first large painting that I did with any sort of skill <laughs> that I had. And it, it came from a planner piece. So I started this one. This is right close to my home. And I did just a little. The study for this was about this big. Wow. And I don't know if you can see me or not, but um, I, it was very small. And so I jumped from this, a small planner study, and then photo. I didn't even take great photo references to this painting. And I think it took me a little bit longer to do this um, because I, it was one of my very first big paintings and I um, jumped from just a small one to a big one. But I had some good critiques on this one too. And, um, and I felt like it was a little bit of a, of a stepping, like, how do you describe it? Just, it was a moment that I, I think I realized I kind of moved another level and, um, and realized that I also loved painting mountains. So, um, it kind of precipitated me moving towards the, um, painting these snow capped mountains with the spring. It's a stunner. Spring. I love this one. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to move on to another one and then. Um, what would you describe as your art style? Um, I, I, I'm not sure, actually, to be honest. I, I had somebody tell me once that I paint um, kind of in between really impressionistic kind of temp contemporary and, and impressionistic realism. So... I think over the years, I'm starting to move a little bit more. I feel like the planar paintings were, were, are much more loose and more impressionistic and, um, and all a prima. And I love that. And I love that look. But I think as I move towards larger paintings, I'm, I think my, my art style is moving a little bit more towards the realism where I'm having to create a little bit more form. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, no, I'm not, not really putting in a lot of detail, but just creating more form. So it's, it's still very impressionistic, but more towards a realism than, than not, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, maybe impressionistic realism. I don't know if that's a term, but <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay. Um, what are some of your main inspirations? Do you have anyone that you really look up to or people you were um, taught by? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's so many. Um, I think when I first started, I... Well, there are so many wonderful artists here in Utah that, that I think a lot of them, and I think if I start naming names, I'm going to forget somebody. But... Um, they, I was, I was really fortunate enough to, to be here and to, to learn from some of them. Um, the first one that I learned from was Rob Adamson. He teaches at Salt Lake Community College. It was that first art class. And he taught me to not be afraid to enter things. And he, I remember for this class, he said he wanted the students to enter some local shows. and. And they weren't juried shows or anything, but this was my very first painting class. I mean, this is my first landscape painting class, a plein air, plein air class. And it was a semester. We did it through the summer and he encouraged us to participate in these shows. And I remember saying to him, I, this is not good enough. I can't, I'm embarrassed to send this to the show. And he said, it doesn't matter. Just do it. It doesn't matter what the heck. And that kind of 
that was a defining moment for me too. And that became my mantra. Like what the heck became my mantra. Like just don't worry about what anybody else thinks. Get out there and learn things and see what you can learn from, from doing these shows and from meeting people. And, and so he, that was kind of the first time that I thought, Oh, I'm so after that, I just started going to anything, any art show, anything, any planner competition, anything I signed up for it and I did it. And, and that taught me that I could be comfortable being uncomfortable. It was so hard for me to do that. It was so, I am kind of a inherently, um, well, lots of things, but <laughs> But shy, it, when I was younger, I was very shy. I'm an introvert, a little bit of perfectionism that comes through sometimes. And I, so it, it, teaching me to get out of my comfort zone and not worry about what other think, people think about it just gave me um, almost I, kind of like power. Like it gave me confidence and power and, and it gave me opportunities that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So he was very influential. Um, in the beginning. And then, um, uh, oh man, I've had such great work. I took some workshops from local people who are such great artists. Um, Josh Clare, um, um, Kimball Geisler is from Idaho. He became a mentor. He became my next mentor and he was fabulous with me. And um, I think that's also important to be able to have mentors that can help. Um, that was also kind of another stepping stone for me was to be brave enough to ask somebody to be my mentor. And I asked him and he said, yes, and it was great. And um, so we've developed a friendship too. And um, so anyway, there are, it's all art, artists whose work I admire. And then I, I was able to, audit a class at BYU taught by David Dibble before he left. And he, he was fabulous teacher as well. And was very influential. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Um, I've had some great critiques from Rhett Ashby, who's my framer. Um, okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to start naming <laughs> it. I'm, I know I'm going to forget somebody, Oh, but I, but beyond, so beyond that, once I started to learn a little bit more, then I started seeing other artists, other masters, both living and those who have passed away. Like I, I love Tim Lawson's work. Um, I love his, um, his design sense. He has sophistication in his colors. It's just, his rendering is beautiful. Um, and it just feels like it feels to me like there's emotion in his paintings that I love. I also am influenced a lot by um, some of the Russian impressionists that also have a different style, I think, than Tim in a way. Um, they seem to paint with a lot of um, bold brush strokes and confidence that just kind of comes through in their, in their work. And I love that. That's influential to me. In fact, I have a sign. I don't have it up now, but I used to have in my, studio sign that said paint like a Russian. And to me, that just meant like paint with confidence and, and be bold. And so those That's are, awesome. so there's some of the, some of my influences. Savannah Davis asks, um, what books do you, um, find most useful for starting your art journey? Is there anything that you can remember, um, having value? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, it's the classics for landscape art. And let me just, you know what, I'm just going to grab them because my brain is I'm not going to remember everything. Um, Carlson, this one is good. Um, okay, I should have had these down. Uh, Edgar Payne. Okay, these are these are classics, but to me, these are the ones that really, I started to really, this one, Landscape Painting, Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting is a classic, and it's written in a way that's understandable and not hard to, to understand, you know, I, I, I mean, I've 
I've highlighted mm -hmm. so much of it. With basic principles. This one is this one is good also, but Edgar Payne's, but it's a little bit more difficult <laughs> for me. It was to read through and understand what he was trying to say, but but it's um I've read through this. In fact, we did a, a book club with some artists and we went through a chapter a week on this. And that kind of helped me internalize some of what he was saying too, when we had discussions about it. So I think that's kind of a fun idea too, is to get a group Love of that. people and have a book club. And then um, this also is fantastic. Oh, Prima too. This is my, it's another one by Richard Schmidt. So those I think are most influential to me, at least right Wonderful. now. So. Um, Julie Hong asks, what would you say to someone who believed they um, had the either you have it or you don't kind of a mindset. Yeah, that's what I had before, right? And I, it's just until I learned that. Um, so I would say you you don't either have it or you don't. It's just you have a little bit of if you like something, there's a little bit of talent or spark in there in you somewhere, and then after that, it's. It is if you want it badly enough, then then it's a lot of work and you just work hard and it's possible. It's it's possible to develop that skill in a way that um, is can be professional. It can be a career. And and I think part of I think for me, too. And here's here's another thought. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't realize until I was older, what that meant to work, to develop a skill. And, and so I feel in a way that art found me when I was ready emotionally and intellectually to take it on. And, and for other people, I'm just a late bloomer. I think I just, I'm a late bloomer, but I, I definitely feel like if you have the desire then and you're willing to work hard for it it's absolutely possible to develop a little bit of some talent into something that is can be a career so I think um, it's a great question <laughs> savannah davis has another question um how do you go about asking someone to be your mentor and build expectations for that kind of relationship that's really hard that's a good question um Honestly, uh, for me, it was, I mean, there were all these artists who I really wanted to, I thought it would be so great to have a mentor. And I, I really thought about, okay, um, how I wanted to be conscious of their career and where they were at that time in their life. And, and um and not be um i don't know how to say it but with kimball i had taken i had, i wanted to ask somebody who had, i'd taken a workshop from because i felt like i was i had he had i had contributed to their teaching or to the as a student for them and he actually and the reason why i asked him was because he said at the end of his workshop that if you ever have any questions after this workshop, feel free to call me. And um, and so I took him up on it. And I think some people have asked people to be mentors and they've said no, and I think that's okay. Um, but I think as you think about who, um, who you want to have mentor, um, I think just, sometimes ask and be okay if it's not a good time for them. And who knows, maybe they'll say yes. I was pretty confident Kimball would say no. And I think uh, that was right when he, it was just a few years after he started his career. So, and it was his very first workshop he taught. And I think if I were to ask him now, I would hesitate a little bit more. He's just kind of busy, <laughs> busy, busy, busy. But um, so maybe do your research too. I don't know. That's Great. the only thing I can think of. Thank Say, you. Yeah. 
So I know you love to be in kind of local shows. Um, what is that kind of process getting ready for those? So I, I feel like that, that's how I started. Um, just getting ready for it is just producing enough paintings to have ready for a show, but, um, being aware of what's going on and, and, um, what shows are when and organizing your year so that you make sure that you're not over extending yourself. Um, I, I, I think for me, um, I got ready for them by just, just painting and it's a lot of work to do, but the things that these local shows did for me was to help me, uh, provide an income to keep my supplies going. And I developed some local collectors who have been great. And, um, from these shows. So I, um, I think there are a lot of things I love about it and a lot of things I don't love about them, the local shows. So I loved talking to people and meeting people and kind of networking and talking to other artists. And there's some great things about that. And um, it's provided some great um, people who love my work. And sometimes you don't always get to meet the people who buy your work. And so this is, you're able to, to buy or to meet the people who actually buy your work. I think last year, I, I mean, having said that I, this year I I'm changing the direction and I'm slowing down a lot on those and focusing a little bit more on some gallery work, but, um, but I think it's a, it, for me, it, it was a great way to start. Good. Um, Savannah has another fabulous question. Um, what do you think makes the biggest difference in whether you are successful at a show or not? Oh, that's, ooh. Mm. Putting your best work out there. Um, being confident as you're standing by your booth. And um, again, just not worrying what people think, just kind of fake it till you make it in a way. And just, um, I feel like being happy and, um, approachable, uh, as people come through and, um, and I don't, I don't know if that's, I, I've, I have seen to find, there are some shows that I, don't sell anything and some shows that I sell everything and, or I have. And so you just never know, but I think generally overall having a booth that looks consistent to your framing is all the same, almost as if you were putting a gallery show together. So consistent, consistent look, not having too many visually too many pieces up there so that your eye can not really know where to focus um, so design wise, I think being conscious of what your booth looks like is important too. And, um, and then just putting your best work out there. I don't know. Does that answer the question? No, I think that works. Yeah. We've okay. got another good question. Um, you've mentioned that you had a feeling which built up that you just wanted or needed to create fine art. Was that exclusively yeah. for landscape painting or did you dabble in any other subjects? It was very, uh, I think it was pretty, in the beginning, pretty exclusive to landscape um, painting. Um, and I don't know why, except that I felt like I loved being outside and I, I love nature. I love being outside and I wanted to be able to, to um, produce work that, that showed that love for landscape. And, you know, that feeling that I had, whether you believe it's, um, a higher power or fate or whatever, I believe it came from God for me that, um, I think that that feeling just kind of, um, was, it, I think it, it came specifically for landscapes, but since then I, 
and I I don't know why, except why I already said, but um, since then I have done some figurative study as well. So I'm trying to um, branch learn out. A, branch out. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'll ever, I don't have the patience to be a figurative artist um, or a portrait artist, but I want the skills to be able to, to develop that, that would hopefully will enhance my, my landscapes or put a few figures here and there in my landscapes. That'd be fun to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was the process um, for you to enter galleries? Would you like to share a little bit about that? Yeah, so I actually, I haven't really ever approached a gallery. I think the galleries I'm in right now have come to me. So um, I don't know. I, I feel like I would like to be in one more gallery. Um, so I'm thinking about probably just getting a body of work that um, I, I honestly, I... <laughs> This is going to sound, uh, I don't know how this is going to sound, but but the reality is I sometimes I don't have enough paintings all in one in one setting to to be able to take somewhere to show. So um, I think they've the process for me has just been they've come to me and then I've given them paintings that they want. That works. That's great. So. Um. Do you have any future plans or aspirations for your career or are you happy where you are? Oh, I have plans. <laughs> I have lots of aspirations and plans and um, I, I know I'm not happy with where I'm at. I, I mean, I'm happy in that I'm happy with the work I'm doing it right now, but I'm not happy that I don't want to be here forever. So um I think I just, um, what I want to have happen with my work is, um, I, I think I'll always be, I have this mindset of I'm always going to be continually learning, right? And I want to get to the point where my skill level doesn't detract from what I want to say in my paintings. And by that, I mean, uh, I heard, okay, so I heard Jeff Hine give this explanation in his Undraped podcast when he was um, interviewing Michelle Dunaway. I don't know if you've seen that one or not, but he, he said very concisely, and I've just kind of taken it up. I loved it. He said, I don't want my skill level to detract from what I... I'm trying to say. And by that, he, he meant, like, for instance, he said, if you hear somebody sing a song um, and the words are beautiful and the accompaniment is beautiful, but the singer can't sing, then you don't have, you're not going to get out of it what you could. And so what he's saying is that develop skills enough that it's, it's you're you're good enough with your skills that you can say what you really want to say. And so I feel like for me, my skill level is not there yet. I I want to develop, I want to get to the point where um that skill level is not going to detract from important things that I want to say. And I feel like that's probably going to be like a a lifelong pursuit. Just have it in my mind that. I, I want to say something important um, in a way that makes people feel something um, light and goodness. And, and I've got to work hard to get to that point. Awesome. Um, is there anything you're doing now to help achieve that? Are you taking workshops yourself? Are you, what are, what are your plans? Well, I have, uh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, I, I touched on it a little bit before, and that is I'm I'm switching this year um, up. I'm I'm not going to be doing probably the local shows this year, and focusing on just really getting some gallery ready pieces. 
um, and work that is um, being able to take the time to do that rather than preparing all the time for the shows. Um, so I want to do that. Um, and then I think um, some teaching also is helping me. I think when we can teach um, and help other people, I think that's, that also helps um, internalize and verb and articulate uh, design principles, which, which hopefully can sink in too. So um, that's, that's kind of what, and, and I still take workshops every once in a while. Um, and I still get critiques. And um, uh, I think that's important to always have some critiques that are, um, you know, some, I, and I think every artist knows this. Sometimes you stare at a painting so long and you think there is something wrong with this and I can't figure it out. And, and then um, having people critique who you trust uh, let you know, oh yeah, that's, this is why it is. This is what you need to fix. So hoping to get some, continue getting some good critiques too. Great. We've got another question about galleries. So as okay. you prepare a work of art for a gallery, what will be your focus? Will your work be within a theme? Do you include a variety or subject and size? How are you deciding on these things? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, I'm trying to I'm trying to work a little bit larger for galleries. Um, so I, I unless I'm doing a specific show for a gallery, I don't know that I really have a theme. I'm just painting what what um, what I'm painting, what what I'm inspired to paint. You know, I feel inspired by. Um, but I feel like that's different than if you were to produce a show or if you were to have a one or two person show, I think there would be more of a, a consistent body of work for that, that you would maybe have a theme um, or something like that. But I haven't done that yet. So, so I'm not, I, that's just what I imagine would happen. Um, I know that you have a workshop coming up in June. Would you like to discuss that? I'm um, sure. Yeah, it's a two-day workshop. It's just going to be here uh, in American Fork where I live. And we'll talk a little bit about, I think the main focus will be on um, planner studies outside and, and being able to um, take all of the information that is out there. There's so much to see and condensing that into some simple shapes and values that, that will be beneficial to bring into the studio to help with some studio pieces. So we'll, we'll, we'll spend time painting outside. We'll spend some time with a little classroom study. Um, we'll also, I'll also touch a little bit on some business uh, ideas. Not a lot. We'll just touch on it. I find that sometimes that, isn't always talked about during workshops. And um, I have, my dad was a small business owner. My husband was a small business owner. And I think I've learned some things from them that I think have helped me uh, in how I think professionally and in terms of I have a small business and uh, what I need to do to have that small business succeed. And so we'll touch a little bit on that too, I think. Awesome. Michelle just asked, how do you structure your studio time, especially with working on a body of work? How do you move through each piece one at a time through its process? Or are you seeing through several different stages at the same time? That's a great question. So I have, uh, so my studio process is, well, first of all, I do have a pretty structured studio time. Like I, I, I know when I come into the studio, I'm going to do this on this day. And I, I have from this time to this time, and then I take a break. And then, then I, I, um, paint again from this time to this time. I don't stick to that as, as well as maybe I should, but so, so when I'm in the studio, I am often working. I often start with a planner painting and 
and then doing little studies from that planner painting. Um, and then if there's something that I feel like, oh, excited about, then I'll take it a little bit bigger. I'll take that painting a little bit bigger. And then I'll, if I still am excited about it, then I'll take it really big. But I also have uh, multiple of these going at the same time, usually. Sometimes I'll get in a, in a situation where I just can't do anything else until I finish this, this painting. But uh, I often have lots of, um, you know, paintings at different stages. In fact, um, I learned this from someone, another artist. I have a schedule that um, every week I have, I, I start, okay, it's, I, I have a production schedule. So like, so I have a, I start two painting, two large paintings, and I finish two paintings. So, well, I start two large, I start two medium and, and about eight small. If I'm getting ready for a show, that's, that's what I do. So I, so I'll start, I'll either finish a large painting from the week or weeks before, but I'll also start another one. So kind of the pipeline is always full, right? Of, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I, I love that. Like I wish I had that. Okay. Um, Keith was asking, I'm wondering if you as embarked on your fine art career, if you had to make any personal sacrifices to make room for it. Um, yeah, so um, I think so, yes. I, I started art um, later in life when my life was not as busy. So I think some sacrifices have, I in, because of that inherently didn't have to make. But um, uh, I feel like time... Um, how do I say this? Like, so, so my priorities really are this, like God first and family and then art. <laughs> and so I have to be careful that sometimes if my art, um, I want to have time for my grandchildren. Sometimes they'll call in the middle of the day and I'll, um, I'll play a little game with them online. And then I'll go back to painting. So, um, but some of the sacrifices that come with that is that I have this business and there are sometimes I just can't, um, can't do things uh, with a family. Um, and I don't want that. I mean, I, tr I need to make sure that I, I'm not neglecting them, I guess is what I'm saying. But at the same time, I, I have a business that I want to, I, that I need to run to. So I don't know if that sacrifices a lot. I, I was doing so much in the beginning that I did spend, I, I was traveling a lot, going to some of these shows and time away from my husband and time away from my, from my children and grandchildren and, um, so I, I just need to, I sometimes need to be careful with that too. I think having balance. Yeah. I uh, seem yeah. to have missed a question about galleries. Um, do you know how galleries have found you through peers getting involved with local shows, shows and markets? Right. Okay. So the three galleries that I have right now, the, the first one, another artist told me, told the owner, Hey, have you seen her work? This is the very first gallery I was in. And so it was another artist that recommended me. And then the second one um, was from meeting a gallery owner who would always was always at the planner events. And I got to know him and he got to know me. And after a couple of years, he came to me and said, I'd like to represent you. And then um, the last one came from, this was, this is a gallery down in Santa Fe, which I got a text from one of my friends who was vacationing down in Santa Fe. And they said, 
I just want you to know that I gave this gallery owner, I showed them your work and they're really excited and they want to take you on. So it was a friend who... What a good friend. I know, right? I can't believe that. It was, it was amazing. So that's... And then ironically enough, well, not ironically, but interestingly enough, I had another friend last week text me and say... Hey, is this yours? And she texted me a painting. They were down on Santa Fe um, vacationing as well. And she didn't know that I was uh, had paintings down there. So it was kind of fun. Man, I need to go to Santa Fe. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know you have an upcoming trip planned for painting and getting referenced. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, yeah, we are. So I, in a couple of weeks, I am going to travel to Israel to paint with two other artists, Liz Harris, who also has a course here at Sentian and Tristan Leach, who has, is associated with Sentian as well. And we are going to go and, um, paint the Holy Land and we're going to spend about 10 days there and um we we had been Tristan and I Tristan and I started painting about the same time and we've kind of met each other early on in our careers and we've stayed friends and in some of our plein air excursions we would talk about things like this and things we wanted to do and one of the things that we talked about was traveling to Israel to um, to paint. We thought that would be fabulous. And it's taken several years for us to get to the point where we felt like we could do it. And so it kind of started with him and me brainstorming and we don't know. It's just kind of a personal, a personal thing that we want to work on. And, um, and then Liz kind of came on as a portrait uh, figurative artist. So um, I think we'll go and do um, probably like we would do normally, just do lots of little studies and paintings and then come back and take some good, well, take some good references and come back and work on some studio pieces. And um, we don't know what will, will happen with that. We hope, I think at some point that maybe we could have a show all together with what we come up with, but for now it's just, we're going to paint and have that experience. So, yeah. Great. Do you have any specific sites you want to visit while you're there? Um, absolutely. Yes. Uh, we are, um, we're going to spend time half of our time will be spent in the Jerusalem area and Bethlehem area. And then we'll spend half of our time up in the Galilee area um, where a lot of um, we'll be focusing on the life of Christ and where he taught and what he did. And um, so um, lots of, lots of wonderful places there where um, I actually spent time as a, a college student in Israel for a semester there. And it was a, a defining moment for me. Um, and so to be able to come back back then, I had no idea I wanted to be an artist, obviously from what you know, but I, uh, now coming back there, going back there, um, is exciting for me to be able to go and, and, and paint some of those, some of those places. So. Great. I'm curious, um, how are you going to travel with your paints? Are you going to pick stuff up there or what's the plan? Yeah. Oh, that I'm still working on that. I, uh, I think Tristan is taking everything acrylic, so he won't have to worry about solvent or anything or drying time. Liz and I are, will be painting with oils. So, um, we will travel with our oils and um, if you're not aware, you can print off a little sheet from the manufacturer of the 
the paint company that is specifically for TSA that will says this is safe, you can have this. So we'll have that printed out. And then um, the Gamzal will probably um, have to get there. But we did find out that I think you can use, you know, like the little sample things, sample bottles of the solvent or the terp. Mm -hmm. If that's sealed and it's a small bottle, I think you can bring those. Wow. We're not sure, but I think you can bring that. So we may, yeah, it's worth a shot. So I think we'll do that. And then trying to figure out the drying time and how we travel, how we bring it back is, is tricky. Um, I think I'll be painting on oil paper and then I, I was just looking at this yesterday. Lori McNee, who is a landscape artist, has this thing on how she travels with it. And she gets wine cork corks and cuts them up and uses those as little dividers in between the paintings oh. so that the wet paintings aren't touching each other. And then she wraps those with blue tape and it's really secure. And so I think I might try that too. I think I'm, I might try that. And uh, just to save space, so I'm not taking a big wet panel carrier. So I was looking on Amazon for a bunch of wine corks <laughs> to buy. <laughs> so have I think you, I'm going to do that. Have you ever thought about traveling with gouache or have you ever painted with that? Yeah, so I thought about gouache and I actually have thought about acrylic and I am not very good at it. I don't have enough experience with it. I think I wish that I was better at it because that would be a perfect way to travel. It would be perfect to be able just to travel with gouache. But this is a big enough trip that I want to feel really comfortable with the work that I'm doing. And for now, that's oil. Great. So hopefully at some point I will be better at gouache and I can use that instead. Mm -hmm. But it would be much easier, much easier to travel with gouache and acrylic is even the same. So yeah. I'm excited to see your work. Oh, well, we're excited to be there. It's going to be an adventure for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Take lots of so, pictures. I, I want to see it on your Instagram. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. We'll we'll probably be posting on Instagram and you can follow along and see where we are. So Jane's handle yeah. is jane.ann.woodhead.art so be sure to follow her um, we've got about seven minutes left is there anything you want to talk about anything you'd like to bring up uh me yeah uh oh gosh let me think um i guess i guess one thing that i want to maybe that i feel like is my mission to put out there is that it's never too late to really do something that you want to do. And um, I, I feel like if you're willing to put in the work, you can do anything, anytime, and it's never too late. Like I, I just, I feel that so strongly, it's never too late. Um, and the other thing that I think has, um, I think has been helpful for me also is that, recognizing art, this art thing is so much of mental, um, mental positivity and, and, um, having a mindset that, uh, you don't just almost kind of, I, I know Brene Brown talks about this just not fake it till you make it, but fake it till you become it. Um, so thinking professionally, kind of fake it until you become it. Like just act as if you are professional and um, you have a small business and you are professional and then keep those negative thoughts at bay and they still creep in. When I first started my art career, I, I really had, um, that drive and that motivation came from inside and I, and I went almost without fear, but as I started to learn how much I didn't know, like over the years, I realized, okay, this is where I want to be. And this is, 
this is where I thought I was and this is really where I am. Sometimes that can get discouraging. And I, um, I think it's important to walk into your studio with a mindset of I can do it. Uh, I may not know how to do it every right now, all of it, but I'm going to work hard and I can figure it out and I can solve problems and I can do it. And, um, let me tell you a little story too. So when I, I, I've been doing art for quite a while and then, um, and then when once I started to realize, oh my word, this is going to take a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> then I it it really was hard for me to not get discouraged, and I would be really hard on myself. And some of that perfectionistic mentality of that's unhealthy. As a side note, I think some of that can be healthy, but for the most part, um, it is uh, just learning how to switch my mind, shift what I'm thinking into um, not thinking those negative thoughts and being positive about what I'm doing. And one day I remember I was doing, it was during COVID and it was a difficult, I was really struggling. I was at the point where I felt like I wasn't getting where I wanted to get. And I just was, not honestly, not really even enjoying what I was doing. And, um, and I had a call from out of the blue, just out of the blue from a, a teacher who was just checking up on me and saying, how are you doing? And he, I mean, he hadn't called before. He hasn't called since, but it came at a time. He said something that has stuck with me. And he said, you he said, Jane, you don't want to be. When you look back at these t in, in 10 years, you don't want to look at that time as being miserable. Like just enjoy, enjoy the process, enjoy where you are. And, and that stuck with me too. Like I, and it, it, it helped me realize, okay, how do I get there? How do I get to the place where I can not, not be impatient with my skill level and getting where I want to get. And, and I think it really comes down to just having that mental positivity. Like I may not, it's okay. It's okay not to know everything and it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to not be where you want to be. But where I am right now is the best of I, that I can be right now. And I'm going to keep learning and I will improve and, and it's okay to, to make mistakes and not, and that that's how we learn. That's how we learn and enjoy the process of learning. Enjoy the process of making mistakes and not having perfect, perfect art. That's well, amazing. I, advice. I need to take that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we all do. Right. I think, I think it's um, some of us maybe more than others, but uh, I think it's power. I, I, I think it is, um, I think it gives us, I think it moves us forward faster than we would normally otherwise. And we're happier in the process. So. Thank you so much, Jane Ann, for joining us. And we loved hearing from you. Um, we'll be able to watch uh, the replay of this in just a couple days. So look out for it. Thank you for coming, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, Savannah and um, Emma Jean. It was great. Thanks for your questions, everyone else. It was great to be here. <laughs>